This is the island of Tonga. Here a 1,200 ton boulder the size of a house sits on a jungle covered cliff, 30 meters above the ocean and hundreds of meters inland. It didn't fall there, it wasn't dragged by anyone, and it was thrown by a single wave. A 50 meter wall of water hurled it uphill. So, what kind of wave does that? And could it happen again? My name is Mark Watts, and in this deep dive, we're looking into the largest waves our planet can produce. Waves that don't just break on the shore, but change the shore. Some rise from nowhere, others race across oceans, and a few are born from disasters so big they reshape coastlines. But what makes one wave a gentle ripple and another a deadly wall? To understand that, we first need to ask, what actually is a wave? Most of the waves we see at the beach are made by wind. Wind blows across the surface of the ocean, transferring energy into the water. The longer and stronger the wind blows and the more open ocean it travels over, the bigger the waves become. These are called wind-driven waves and they're the ones surfers chase. But waves aren't really water moving across the sea, they're energy moving through water. Think of it like a crowd at a stadium doing the wave. No one person moves all the way around, but the movement travels. In water, that movement carries real energy, and sometimes that energy adds up in dangerous ways. Some waves are made by the sudden movement of land. Others form when enormous chunks of ice or rock crash into the sea. And some seem to just appear. That's when things get weird. Let's start with rogue waves. For centuries, sailors told stories of freak waves, massive walls of water that rose out of calm seas and capsized ships. Most people didn't believe them. There was no proof, no photos, just tales passed down like ghost stories until 1995. On New Year's Day, the Dropna Royal platform in the North Sea recorded a wave unlike any ever measured before. It stood 25.6 meters high, more than twice the height of the surrounding waves. It appeared without warning, smashed into the platform and disappeared. That was the first confirmed rogue wave. So how does something like that happen? Imagine dropping pebbles into a pond. Each one sends out ripples. Sometimes those ripples overlap. When two wave crests line up, they combine, briefly creating a taller wave. Do that with hundreds of waves in a stormy sea and occasionally they all sync up. That's a rogue wave, it's not magic, it's math. Rogue waves form through constructive interference where multiple waves intersect and amplify each other's height. They can also be shaped by underwater currents, seafloor topography and weather conditions that funnel wave energy into a single point. Some rogue waves have been measured at nearly 30 meters tall. That's a nine-story building rising out of the ocean. In 2020, a rogue wave measuring 17.6 meters was recorded off the coast of British Columbia near Uklualet. While not the tallest ever seen, it was nearly three times the height of surrounding waves, making it the most extreme rogue wave ever measured relative to its sea state. And they're not just tall, they're steep. Rogue waves can have nearly vertical faces, crashing with immense force. Ships that survive them often report smashed windows five or six decks above the waterline. But here's the thing. Rogue waves don't travel far. They rise quickly, collapse just as fast and vanish. They don't spread across oceans. They strike and disappear, which makes them terrifying and nearly impossible to predict. So if rogue waves are brief and brutal, what happens when a wave travels halfway around the world? That's when we get into tsunamis. Tsunamis are not just big waves, they're energy pulses that move through the entire depth of the ocean. When an underwater earthquake shifts the sea floor, it pushes a massive amount of water up or down. That displacement sends ripples outward in all directions. In deep water, a tsunami might only be a few centimeters high. Boats won't even feel it but it travels at jetliner speed, up to 800 kilometers per hour. The danger comes when the tsunami reaches shallow coastal water. As it slows down, it builds in height. That low ripple becomes a fast moving wall. The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami was triggered by a magnitude 9.1 earthquake. 
It killed over 230,000 people across 14 countries. In some places, the wave reached 30 meters high. In 2011, Japan was struck by another massive tsunami after a 9.0 earthquake. Waves reached 40 meters in some regions. Entire towns were wiped out. The wave even reached California hours later. Tsunamis aren't like regular waves. They don't curl and break, they surge. They don't just hit, they keep coming. It's more like a fast rising tide with the power of a freight train. They can also be caused by volcanic eruptions and the underwater landslides. In 2018, the Anak Krakatau volcano in Indonesia collapsed into the sea. The resulting tsunami killed over 400 people without warning. And in 1998, a submarine landslide off Papua New Guinea generated a tsunami over 15 meters high that devastated coastal villages. The trigger? A relatively small earthquake that caused an underwater slope to collapse. One of the most far-reaching tsunamis ever recorded came in 1960, following the largest earthquake in modern history, a magnitude 9.5 quake off the coast of Chile. The resulting tsunami raced across the Pacific Ocean, striking Hawaii, Japan, the Philippines and even parts of California. Waves over 10 meters high were reported thousands of kilometers from the epicenter. It was a stark reminder that a tsunami doesn't have to be local to be deadly. So if that's a tsunami, what happens when a whole mountain falls into the sea? That's a mega tsunami. In 1958 in Lituya Bay, Alaska, a 90 million ton rock slide fell into the water after an earthquake. It created the largest wave ever recorded. 524 meters high. That's taller than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower stacked together. The waves stripped trees off the surrounding hillsides. Boats in the bay were lifted hundreds of feet and dropped. Two people died, but others, amazingly, survived. One fishing boat was lifted hundreds of feet by the wave, carried across the bay and set down in the water again. They had no control, just rowed it out and somehow lived to tell the story. Mega tsunamis are rare, but they happen. They don't travel far like regular tsunamis. Their power is focused, local and extreme. They occur when a massive amount of material, rock, glacier, volcanic debris, falls suddenly into water, displacing it violently. There's another boulder in Tonga, the one we mentioned at the start. It's called Makalahi, 14 meters long, 12 meters wide weighs about 1,200 tonnes. It sits over 30 metres above sea level and more than 200 metres inland. Scientists believe it was thrown there by a mega tsunami thousands of years ago. Numerical simulations estimate that a tsunami with waves reaching 50 metres high, lasting about 90 seconds, would have been required to dislodge and transport the boulder to its current location, making it the world's largest known clifftop boulder moved by wave action. And it's not alone. Geologists have found dozens of other mega boulders nearby, each one a relic of a colossal wave event. And then there's the Storega Slide. Around 8,000 years ago, a massive undersea landslide off the coast of Norway caused a tsunami that struck parts of Scotland with waves up to 20 metres high. It was one of the largest known submarine landslides, and it shows that even slow-moving geological processes can suddenly unleash massive energy. So what's the biggest wave Earth has ever seen? For that, we have to go back 66 million years when an asteroid the size of a city slammed into the ocean off Mexico's coast, it triggered a global disaster. The initial impact likely created a wave several kilometers tall. Even across oceans, the tsunamis it produced were over 100 meters high. That event ended the age of the dinosaurs, and it shows us that waves are not just local threats. Under the right circumstances, they can become planetary. But here's the question we have to ask now. Could waves like this happen again? And the uncomfortable answer is yes. The more we study Earth's oceans, the more we realize that wave risk is changing. Climate change is altering the dynamics of our coastlines. Storms are becoming more intense. Sea levels are rising. Glaciers and permafrost are melting. 
making landslides more likely in mountain and polar regions. In 2015, a massive landslide in Tarn Fjord, Alaska, created a wave 193 meters high. Fortunately, no one was nearby. But similar areas around the world are under watch. Scientists are monitoring unstable slopes in Greenland, Norway and the Himalayas. Some areas have the potential to trigger mega tsunamis if the conditions are right. But why do some coastlines suffer worse impacts than others? The answer lies beneath the surface. The shape of the seafloor or bathymetry can focus or deflect tsunami energy. Bays, inlets and steep underwater slopes can amplify wave heights dramatically. Think of it like a funnel, narrowing energy into a single point. That's why places like Hilo, Hawaii, have suffered repeated tsunami damage. The shape of the bay concentrates incoming wave energy, turning moderate tsunamis into catastrophic ones. Similarly, steep offshore topography can cause waves to rise abruptly. The same earthquake might cause a 5-meter wave in one place and a 20-meter wall in another. Understanding local geography is just as important as measuring the earthquake itself, because where the wave hits and how is what determines the outcome. And as we build more infrastructure near coasts, ports, resorts, nuclear plants, we're increasing our exposure. Ships are getting bigger, offshore platforms are more common, coastal populations are growing. A tsunami today doesn't just threaten a fishing village, it can shut down entire economies. On the bright side, we're better prepared than ever. Tsunami warning systems span most of the world's oceans. Satellites and seafloor sensors can detect threats within minutes. Some rogue wave detection systems are even being tested. New materials and engineering are being used to design seawalls, elevated platforms and floating structures that can survive extreme wave impacts. Artificial intelligence is also being trained to analyse real-time ocean data, looking for patterns that could indicate developing rogue waves or landslide-triggered tsunamis. Tsunami simulation models now run continuously at global monitoring centres. Within minutes of a major quake, scientists can estimate wave arrival times and likely impact zones, giving communities precious time to evacuate. And in some regions, cell towers and sirens are already wired to automatically alert the public when sensors detect a threat. We are getting faster, smarter, more resilient. But the truth is, there will always be surprises, because water, for all its beauty and calm, is still one of the most powerful forces on Earth. It can rise, it can race, it can destroy, and it can remind us, in moments of overwhelming force, that we are not in control. Yet with knowledge, with preparation, with humility, we can live with these waves. We can learn from the boulders left behind, from the forests stripped away, from the scars written into the land. Because even the biggest wave begins with a ripple, and thanks to science we can see those ripples sooner. We can understand how waves form, how they move and how they affect our coasts. We can build better warning systems, engineer stronger infrastructure and make smarter decisions about where we live and how we prepare. Science won't stop the waves, but it gives us the power to survive them. The more we learn, the more we respect the forces that shape our world, and the more we invest in that knowledge, the more resilient we become. If you're curious about the incredible power of nature and how science helps us understand it, you're in the right place. I make these videos because I love digging into how the world works, and I think it's worth sharing. If you found this one interesting, please consider subscribing and supporting the channel.